Um, I, this is Alexa Bradley. I wanted to see if Sue uh, Chiblow would be willing to introduce, uh, we have a really special opening, uh, Sue would be willing to introduce um, our singer. Hello everybody. Um, nice to be, uh, be part of this today. I'm going to be introducing uh, Doreen Day. She is a uh, Anishinaabe Kwe and a water walker. Um, I'll let her tell you how the water song came about with her gang. Uh, we really look forward to hearing her and I don't know if it's your students, but there's some young people in the back share their voices. Okay, bonjour Good afternoon. My name is Doreen Day, and I'm from the Net Lake Reservation in Minnesota, and I am an Anishinaabe Ojibwe woman. I'm honored to be with you today. Uh, I wanted to briefly talk about the song. The song is about uh, For the Water, and, and uh, it follows along with Dr. Emoto's Universal Water Prayer, which is water, we love you, we thank you, we respect you. And during the time that I drove my My grandson to work I began to talk to the water and at first we did not know how to do so in the language and so we just began saying we love you we thank you we respect and then one day, about eight months into our journeys, my grandson asked me to uh, talk about uh, say, trying to find out how to say it in our language, and so I did. My daughter's language instructor um, and, and sent us an email with the information. So the, then we began to say it in the language, Nibe. And so one day, my grandson asked me uh, several months later, um, Grandma, Awalita, would you please sing that? Don't you think the water would just love that? And so it was that a melody came immediately, and we began to sing it. So I'm going to ask my, my uh, young people here with me. They are a part of a uh, uh, Gitigan Inu. They're learning how to be uh, stewards of the earth, to grow good foods, to grow natural foods. They're learning to reclaim that relationship that we have with Mother Earth. And um, they're in a one week long uh, Nishinaabe garden program that I'm doing. Hi, Ricardo. So uh, they're all behind me here, and they're going to help me sing this today. We're going to adjust the cam so that you can see them as well. I'm going to.
You. There's a call that are also sending their thanks. No, we can't hear. together to take care of that. So the Great Lakes of Commons arose um, from a care about the water, a love of these waters. Uh, these Great Lakes and also a real concern about them that uh, although many of us are involved in the in all sorts of issues and efforts to protect the water that we can see that the threats continue to grow and um, even as we gain ground in one area there are more threats here and so the conversation among us uh, as we started to think about the Great Lakes Commons work was how how do we spark something new and different uh, we can see that something's really missing in the landscape and so our work has been to uh, foster a political and, and social and uh, community-led initiative that could create a new public conversation, a new public initiative. And we wanted a conversation where the starting point was a care about the water, that our starting point was a view of the water as the source of life, not a commodity or a resource water as place, as history, as meaning, as, a, as reverence, as joy, as life. 
and um, that that was the conversation we knew needed to happen. We also wanted to create an initiative and a conversation where all of us mattered, that it wasn't just uh, those somewhere up in some high government agency or a professional activist that was called upon to take care of the lakes, but that all of us were, that each of us in, in many different ways, as an artist, as an engineer, as a scientist, as an activist, as a food grower, as a teacher, everyone, no matter what you did uh, in the bioregion, had a role to play in the care of the lakes. And so we turned to the teachings of the commons and also of indigenous communities to uh, begin to explore how can we create the kind of community, the kind of understanding that would really enable us to protect these waters. And that's what the Great Lakes Commons work has been uh, deeply about. And you're going to hear today about the charter, which is one of the tools and strategies we're using to build that commons community and to start a public conversation that is a much higher bar and, and a much deeper bar about a deeper uh, level on which um, to focus our attention in terms of the care of the lake. Um, sorry. Um, um, I wanted to say just one word about this idea of the commons. Hopefully you can see the screen. Um, just to demystify that word, uh, the commons is a, is a word that is used to describe those things that we share, take care of together, and pass on undiminished. And clearly our water is something that we uh, want to care for and um, act responsibly toward and with. So we consider that a commons. Um, there's other words for commons, that's just one, but that's partly why we're using that term and seeking to braid our approach with the indigenous knowledge of the care of the lakes. So you'll see that reflected in the call today and some of the um, things that people will be sharing with us. Um, with that, I think I'm going to pass it to Ricardo Levens Morales, who can introduce himself. Um, again, I'm Alexa Bradley. I'm part of the group that's been um, helping develop this open and growing network we call the Great Lakes Commons. And I want to welcome all of you. I hope you all consider yourself now part of the Great Lakes Commons. And um, we look forward to what you'll bring to that. Um, thanks, Ricardo. I'll give it to you to talk about the Charter. Ricardo, are you there? Uh, Ricardo, we need to, to get your mic up. Ricardo? Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Um, so I want to thank everyone for being here. It's wonderful to be with you. Um, my name is Ricardo Levins Morales. I'm from Puerto Rico. But, and I live now at the meeting place of three great watersheds in Minnesota. The Great Lakes Commons Charter is the piece that I've been working on for the last a couple of years. And it's being brought to life as
But touching deeply enough held values has to be unifying, and it became the magnetic pole of the freedom struggle. Even now, when the African National Congress has drunk the neoliberal Kool-Aid, the poor people's movements that have arisen to challenge it turn to the charter as the touchstone for their struggle. Move forward several decades to the early 1980s, when US activist professor Robert Bullard coined the phrase, environmental justice. And immediately, as it was as though lights went on all over the continent. Suddenly, poor and dark communities facing municipal landfills in North Carolina, uranium tailings in Navajo, lead paint poisoning in Oakland, and um, asthma from coal dust in Chicago became visible to each other, became wings of one movement, um, had each other's back, and had a story that could galvanize and encourage other communities facing racial and chemical toxin. Our intent is to establish the, the charter among the people of the Great Lakes region as the legitimate, non-negotiable basis 
for decisions affecting the waters, the hydrological, human, and ecological systems of the Great Lakes Basin, and to put wind in the sails of all of those many struggles that are taking place, usually under conditions of isolation from each other, that, that are fighting to preserve and protect the waters, and to that we want to ultimately add, restore. If you're negotiating provincial land use policies in Quebec, protesting municipal water utility shutoffs in Detroit, designing public school curricula on the environment in the state New York, or blocking mining complex train shipments moving across land in Wisconsin, we want to be able to have a wind that fills all of our sails and that aligns us so that our efforts are um, turn a turbine and not simply hamster wheels. We want to make it commonplace that whatever violates the simple, clear, and necessary principles of the Charter is not permissible, and that every person, organization, and community has both a right and an obligation to stop it. In line with Commons principles, the Charter process belongs to no organization or collection of individuals. An organization campaign is like horticulture. You water the plant that you want to grow. A good rain, on the other hand, unleashes creativity throughout the forest. This process is fundamentally about us, the peoples of the lakes, and the other creatures for whom we must be worthy and unfailing allies. We are asking for endorsements and signers to add to the momentum by attaching their names to the charter, but it's not a petition. It will not be submitted to some government for their approval time has long passed. It will instead be planted in the communities of the Great Lakes. The Charter seed has been nurtured for several years by remarkable fellowship and sisterhood of commoners. We're now taking steps to place it in your hands, not to lure you away from your vital and urgent tasks, but to propose a unifying principle that can align all our struggles and address the threat facing the Great Lakes at its source. We envision enlisting charter bearers to introduce and use it and educate in communities of all kinds throughout the region in respectful relationship with the organic traditions, leaders, activists, youth of each place. To me, what makes this process exciting and unique, and what we're really offering to you, the frontline organizers, is that it's, at its heart, it relies on what should be by rights our most powerful source of renewable energy and what is undoubtedly our deepest and greatest untapped natural resource. Hope. Now, I'd like to invite longtime water protector and daughter of Chalchiliquwe, Tara Chadwick, to join me in reading some of the clauses, the affirmations from the Charter Declaration. Tara, are you with us? You're still here and unmuted. Can you um, make Tara's voice live? Ah. Ah. This is on. Conjure her as a, you can conjure her as reading every alternate line. <laughs> and Tara, feel free to raise your hand if you are able to join us. Um, so Thank after you. the introduction, um, introductory parts so of the what, what charter, do now, um, we move on to the affirmations. Do, to this uh, end, we affirm we have, uh, four that the waters of the Great Lakes have sustained the lives of the people and communities who have been in their basins since time immemorial, and they should continue to do so uh, in perpetuity. That the waters ecosystem communities of the Great Lakes uh, are entwined and interdependent. Damage to any of these causes harm to the others. That the Great Lakes are a gift and a responsibility held in common by the peoples and communities of the lakes and must be treated as such so as to ensure their preservation for coming generations. That the boundaries of states, provinces, and nations crisscross the lakes but do not divide their natural integrity. All decision-making that impacts the lakes must place the well-being of the bioregion and system as a whole at the center of consideration. 
that the inherent sovereignty and rights of indigenous peoples as codified in treaties and international agreements must be upheld as foundational to commons governance. Therefore, we join our voices in affirming the spirit and necessity of this declaration as the foundation for a new relationship and mode of governance for our Great Lakes Commons. invitation laying out today. How's that? Okay, good afternoon. Uh, good to uh, be part of this and to be able to speak with folks. Um, as you can see in the slide that's on right now, when you look at the region of the Great Lakes, you don't see borders. You see the lakes and the land. And for those of us uh, from indigenous communities here, you know, we've, we've done our best to live in balance and follow our traditional teachings in this region. There's, um, uh, we have, we're taught that to try to be in balance, and, and we think of the teachings of the four directions of the east, the south, the west, and the north, and the seasons, which are the spring and summer, and autumn and winter, but also earth, fire, wind, and water. And to try to find the balance in this, and that the water is essential for life. We know this, and that we have to spend our time as we seek that balance in our lives and in our families and communities, we have to honor and respect all of these different elements. And when we get too far in one direction, we get out of balance and we don't do the things that are necessary for us. And so we have the, the, the women are the, are the ones who are responsible for, in our native culture, for the water for the water. It's the men's duty to assist them. Just like the men's duty is to protect the fire and to work with the fire, the women also assist the men. So we, we work with each other. And in that regard, we all work together to find, find ways to help preserve the water. There's, uh, we know that water is the lifeblood of Mother Earth, the way we think of it. And when we think of Mother Earth, we don't think that Mother Earth is not a commodity. Mother Earth is a relative. And all of the beings that we share this, this creation with are our relatives. So when we work on trying to think of the water, we don't just think of the water as a commodity or something that, that we use for ourselves. But that water is something that is used by all of life. And we, we share that. And when we take the water and we and we disrespect it in whatever way we do, those that disrespect doesn't just harm us, but it harms all of creation. And so we try to find ways to do that in a try to find ways to strengthen the water and to, and to protect those coming generations as well, not generations just of our of human beings, but the generations of the plant beings and all of the other creatures that we share this world with. And so, the, when we start thinking about the borders and the different jurisdictions and how it's all divided up, and you know, the, the, it's really complicated in how we deal with this ecosystem. And a fish doesn't know whether it's Canadian or U.S. It doesn't know whether it's Michigan or Wisconsin or doesn't know if it's Milwaukee or Detroit. The fish lives in the water. And so the, the issues here is that the ecosystem as a whole, from the native perspective, when we harm one part of it, we harm all of it. And so 
we have to think regionally of it. We think of the spirit of water, not just. Alexa, are you muted? Yeah.
being told by elders then the importance and and the the need for immediate need for changing acting with the waters because we are our current destruction and if we do not become more aware and start to increase the awareness that we just cannot continue to pollute the waters the way we are that life as we know it will not no longer be on this earth so the urgency of that message and getting that out to all peoples, no matter what your religious background is, no matter where you live or what you do, it's just important that we somehow put ourselves together. I was at um, a conference last, just this past few days, and there was um, a gentleman speaking, um, and he is um, Mohawk, and he was talking about how the earth has changed us to to has changed us and evolved us into um, what we have become. And if we think about the climate change and how climate change has pulled different scientists from different fields together to try and start to discuss and address the issues that humans are creating and how, how powerful that is and, and if how we allow the waters to pull us all together, that how powerful we can become with all of our minds coming together to come up with solutions on how to interact with the water and learn to respect the water again. Um, so I guess I will leave with that. And thank you, thank you for your time. Um, I just wanted to follow up on something that both Frank and Sue mentioned. Um, Um, on the Great Lakes Commons website, in conjunction with the Charter, we're trying to also um, include principles and teachings that come from different traditions. And so, um, on the after you read the declaration that Ricardo was reading from, there's also some gathered uh, teachings and principles, and there's excerpts from the documents, the Water Accord, um, and some other water declarations, the indigenous water declarations, and then other communities that also have put forward um, principles um, about how we should take care of our water. So you can find those at greatlakescommons.org and the charter section. Hopefully you all got that link and we can share it later too. Um, that's a good segue to asking Ann Brummett from Milwaukee Water Commons to share um, the work that's been happening in that city to um, build a water, a water stewardship ethic. Um, we reawaken that process. So Ann, I'll turn it to you. Are you there? 
Yes, I'm here. Thank you, Alexa, and thanks everyone for being here. Um, yeah, I just want to tell you a little bit about the effort that we have um, going on in Milwaukee. Um, we're calling it the Milwaukee Water Commons, and it really it it sprang out of um, the Notre Dame gathering that the Great Lakes Commons put on um, almost two years ago, um, and there was a group of uh, Milwaukeeans that came to that gathering, including myself, um, some academics, artists, um, uh, and uh, just a, a small group of us that attended that gathering and, and were inspired to come back to Milwaukee and just explore um, if there was energy and interest in um, trying to foster an effort here specifically for Milwaukee. Um, Milwaukee is really trying to position itself as a, a freshwater hub as well. What it's been called by largely sort of business and downtown interests um, and position itself in you know increasing scarcity with, with all the, the issues that are arising that um, we might it might help move forward Forward our, our economy and be a, a driver for the economy here, um, and so there there are concerns that um, if that's the territory that we're going to stake out, what is that going to look like for the city, and what does that mean for leadership and for stewardship? Um, and so with all of that going on, um, we came back to Milwaukee. And we began a pilot program.
discussion uh, coming up, and that uh, everyone's got some got a role to play in this community. Thank you. Frank, and I just wanted to uh, ask Alexa, perhaps you might explain to people how they raise their hand. So I just saw, um, so I'll just take people one at a time. So Bree um, had her hand raised. So Bree, you're just going to have to enable your microphone. So it's the second icon in, uh, and then you'll just have to start your microphone. And for folks who are being queued up, if you could just get ready to, um, to start your microphone as well. And if you have two microphones on your computer, you're going to have to click on the icon and at the bottom of the list it'll say select microphone and you'll just have to choose the one that you're, that you're using. Um, while we're waiting for that, I noticed that um, a number of people are typing in. We're going to try to keep track of that. Um, Anne was mentioning the August 3rd of We Are Water event. Um, and you can find out more soon on the Great Lakes Commons website about that, um, or you can write to um, us at Milwaukee Water Commons. Um, let's see. Is it, okay, Bree, it looks like you're enabled. Can, can you speak? Bree, can we, can we hear Bree? Bree, if you're having trouble, maybe you could uh, type in the chat. Uh, what's going on? Um, I know that there was also uh, Lynn, Lynn, Lynn Katz Cherry. Uh, so I've enabled your microphone if you want to go while while Bree is. is can you hear me? Notice. Yes, we can. Oh, good. Is that <laughs> I Bree or Lynn? Tell. Good. I'm going to mute my um, speakers so that there's no feedback. Yes, okay. thank you. I'm Lynn Katz Cherry from Gary, Indiana, which is the very southern tip of Lake Michigan. Um, I'm really impressed by the uh, uh, Commons Declaration. I think this is just extremely exciting. I'm um, really uh, excited and anxious to become part of it. I've been working on Great Lakes issues for wow, almost 30 years now as a Great Lakes toxic, toxics activist and advocate um, on human health and uh, exposure to toxic chemicals. So um, I'm really excited to invite anybody else who's on the call and other people who are involved in the Commons to join me and other um, people that I'm working with around 
um, the Great Lakes Basin, both in Canada and the U.S., to become involved in um, doing very specific things around keeping, restoring our waters and protecting the Great Lakes waters from the huge amount of toxics that are going into our waters and contaminating our waters still. Um, so I don't know if there are ways that we can communicate with each other through the comments. I did join, and you can find me on the, I think on the comments webpage. I did join the meetup, I think, and um, but um, there are um, there's going to be a lot of exciting things coming in the future. Some market campaigns throughout the basin, and there are a lot of toxic policy um, things going on both in the U.S. and Canada. And right now, I'm extremely involved in the Great Lakes Water Quality Protocol, the 2012 Great Lakes Water Quality Protocol, which is the latest iteration of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. And I'm on the Annex 3 extended subcommittee, and we're still trying to figure out what that means as an NGO. Linda, there we really, uh, the other NGOs and I really are looking for lots of support from the NGO community to let the parties know how much the public is really, really anxious to get action on um, protecting the Great Lakes from the, the chemicals in um, not just industrial emissions, of which there are still many, but also in, in personal care products. So like Lynn, I said, Alexa, thank you uh, so much for all the work that's been done on this to get, get this going. And um, I'm very excited about it. And I'm very looking really forward to working with as many different people around the basin as possible. And that's our particular niche is nice. on toxic chemicals and um, protecting the lakes from um, the continuing influx of toxics into the lakes. Thanks. Thank you, Lynn. This is this is Alexa. Can people hear me? Can you hear me? Um, can uh, yeah, we can hear you. I couldn't. Now, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, thank you, Lynn. And if there is a, a website that you want to share, um, you can type that into the chat box. We also, people, as Lynn mentioned, there is a meetup on our website, so you can type um, you can type in and join that, and that's a way of finding other people in your community and finding out about events. You can uh, go onto our Facebook page and like that, and that's a way of also see, sharing and seeing what's happening in the region. Um, so those are just a several ways you can also uh, email us and, and, and uh, get in touch that way. And um, again, this is really an open and growing network. So it's, um, it's not like a normal NGO with a big staff or anything like that. It really is uh, lightly staffed, and it really is all of us collaborating that makes it, makes it go. Um, is there anyone else queued up, Emma, that wants to share some reflections about the charter? Yeah, so I think maybe we'll try Bree again. Bree, can okay. you speak into your microphone? Okay. We're not able to hear you. Um, hmm. Okay. Well, um, maybe, Brie, if you can just uh, type in the chat uh, what's going on. And in the meantime, we'll go to Gail. So I've turned on your microphone, Gail. You'll just have to enable your mic by clicking the icon just at the top, the second one in. Yeah, can you, can we hear you? Uh, go up to that microphone icon and click it there uh, that says enable my microphone. Uh, I think I can hear you. Can you raise the volume? Uh, hear you. Um, you might need to select a different microphone if you've got two there. Um, that's also in that little menu there.
we we can't hear you very well. I can hear that you're talking. Um, if you go to the arrow next to the microphone, there may be a way to turn up your volume or to select a different microphone if you have two. Thanks, everyone, for bearing with the technology challenges here. Um, Gail, do you, are you, can you, uh, are you able to adjust your volume? Gail typing, okay. All right, and Bree did um, put her comments into the box here, so you can look to see what that is. Um, some of the comments I'll just read quickly here. Um, we have a comment from Kathy Skerritt, who is beginning to, beginning to convene the Commons conversation across communities in northeastern Ohio. So um, we'll have a way to link to that up on our website shortly uh, if you're in that area. Um, there's, there's more here that Kathy's sharing. Um, let's see. Um, Gail, are you able to join us? Uh, looks like Melissa Johnston, who is calling in, for, uh, writing in from, is it the Toronto area, Melissa, I think? So there are a number of people involved in Toronto, so any of you who are in that area, there's, uh, there's a meetup there and um, a good group going. You guys should do something on August 3rd, for sure. Um, Okay, we do have a couple other people who have raised their hands. So, Gail, I'm not sure uh, what's happening with your microphone, but maybe you can uh, type in, in chat and we can try and help you out. But uh, in the meantime, maybe we can go to Chris. So, I, Chris, I'm just going to enable your microphone now. So you'll just have to go up top to the icon and turn on your microphone. If you have more than one, you'll have to select you'll have to select which microphone you're using. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that seems to be working now. Okay. Hey, hey everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm a, I'm a writer. I've been uh, working on a story about the Great Lakes Commons for a while. I spoke with Paul Baines a while back about the map. And um, so yeah, it's just really encouraging to see how uh, this is developing along. Now there's been a lot of progress here because um, you know it, it kind of is a small movement and there, it, there's definitely a lot of work to be done because you know making anything as a commons is uh, just a, a monumental task. You know it would take a really long time to really uh, put the correct kind of systems in place that would actually uh, protect it as such. You know it's a really huge task. So you know there's a lot of work to be done in that area. For sure, but um, I'd, uh, I'm just really interested right now in um, finding out if there's any uh, actual events going on or any more uh, gatherings in any uh, any areas around. Uh, well, I'm in Montreal right now. I don't know if there's anything uh, Commons related going on here, but um, yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, it is encouraging to see there's been a lot of progress here, although it is going to be a very difficult and uh, long process. So. Um, now, if there are any uh, any like uh, events or uh, gatherings going on, uh, I'd like to find out more about them so I could uh, just find out more about this and uh, get deeper into the story. Okay, uh, so next we have Julie. Julie, I'm just going to enable your microphone. So you'll just need to go up at the top, uh, straight your microphone. It's the second icon in. Julie? <laughs> you might also have to select a microphone if there's more than one. Um, so you'll just click the microphone icon again, and then just go to the bottom of the list. It'll say select microphone. 
Can you hear me? Can you hear yeah, me? Yeah. Oh, how exciting. You can hear me? Emma, can you yes. hear me? Great. Yep. Hi, everyone. Great. I was successful. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Julie Ristow. I'm, I'm, I'm here in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and part of the leadership team for On the Commons, which was has been an accompanier uh, to the Great Lakes Commons since its inception and has helped to incubate it. And I'm very excited to be listening to everyone today. My question uh, really is about the whole notion of um, what we're loosely calling charter bearers. And I'm wondering if, um, if we could talk a little bit more about that in terms of um, how some of us might become more active in our communities. I know there's been this uh, wonderful team of people meeting for quite some time around the ch social charter and just wondered if any of you might be willing to share some of the ideas or thoughts about next steps around that social um, charter bearer uh, work that we are trying to kind of launch um, right now. So any comments from any of you would be really helpful. What was the last part of the question? What was the last part of your question? Charter bearers? I mean, I mean, I know that it, I mean, it's a huge, it's a huge region, a huge, huge area, and so um, we talked about this idea. Of, I mean, the broad language is, you know, helping this charter sort of come alive in your community. And I know there's been, I've been sort of focusing on the chat box, that's why I'm a bit distracted, but like, you know, working with youth or working with policy makers, um, Anne talked uh, quite well about what's going on in Milwaukee, and so it's hard to have this like blueprint of how to actually make it fit depending on where you are. But I think the idea, the language of a charter champion or a charter bearer is to sort of like see how this language that, again, Ricardo introduced to us uh, earlier can you know, affect what's already going on. Like one of my, part of my presentations we, that we did recently was that commons is often hiding in plain sight. And so if you're, you know, working in the community, even, you know, doing a stream restoration or, or doing a, a talk about bald water or learning about the species of fish uh, in, your, in your lake, like you are doing that connecting uh, that is sort of fundamental to, you know, being a water commoner. And so I think it's, there's so many different ways of like bringing this, but my, my agenda or my, my intention the last couple of weeks especially has been how can we take all these things that are, that are going on 
and not to sort of like take anything away from them, but to add in, oh, that sounds like it's you know looking at multiple generations, like 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 a, like a like a trustee would, or oh, that has a form of equity in it, which looks at power relationships, and that's really about trying to um, create a sense of a community, or oh, like there's a priority of use here, and that priority of use needs to be people over profit, or you know um, local local needs versus you know uh, you know global trade, and so I think it's about trying to connect those a lot of those local efforts to a broader picture of not just pipelines or fertilizers or certain species um, or whatever, but looking at, again, the sort of the governance issues uh, broadly and our connection more, more personally. And so I'm going to be traveling a little bit of the Great Lakes this summer, and people can love to get in touch with me. And I think, you know, we're trying to build our toolkit on the website where people can share other ideas and, and tools for making these connections, both personally and bioregionally. And I think the spirit of the collaborative map is, is a knowledge map, a knowledge commons in which you know, all these good ideas and, and concerns can be, can be located with people's names and places so then we could sort of, again, work across these large areas. And so the commons map could use text, photo, or video, and we can start making the connections and connect the dots literally, uh, but also thematically, and that's that's how I see things moving forward. That's it. And did you have a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to add to that, you know, just a very practical thing that, that you That's all. This is Frank, and I just wanted to uh, uh, to add to that 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 the, a charter bearer is someone who reads this and is moved by it and decides to do something with it. It's not some. There isn't a list of charter bearers. There isn't an application process to become a charter bearer. It's this is a personal decision. It's a personal thing that that people will feel. And if they're moved by this and want to work with it and to start working with others, uh, you become a charter bearer through your action. Okay, that's great. Are there any other comments or anybody else want to raise their hand? Emma, this is Alexa. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. um, uh, someone put up the toolkit. There'll be other ideas that are going to be added to the toolkit in terms of ways you can bring it to your community. Um, and that can range in any kind of different response, as Frank said. We really hope that people will take this and bring it to life in their community. We also, um, the principles that people have been, and, and the teachings that people have been mentioning on our website, we're trying to gather those, just as Anne talked about the Milwaukee ones and 
Uh, Frank and Sue talked about the different water accords and declarations. We want to gather those. So if you have um, principles or teachings that are um, you become aware of in your community or you develop in your community, share them with us because we'll share those on the website. We're trying to gather the wisdom that we know exists in our communities to take care of these waters and to revive that and share that and find the common ground in that. So um, again, that's really helpful. Helpful uh, to, as you do this, if it's a small group or a large group, we want to hear from you. From you. We want, and we also want you to sign your support for this declaration. So that's another thing you can share and support it. Um, so you can sign it. You can ask others to sign it. You can have a discussion about it. Um, you can make any kind of offering at all. Are there other people that want to speak? I notice people are typing in. Are there other people with their hands up? Any other comments that people want to share from the group that's listening in? We have quite a few people on. Are there any other questions or comments? Um, Lynn, Lynn, uh, Lynn is asking, where can you sign your support? If you go onto the Great Lakes Commons website and you click Charter, there is a link where it says, um, I think it says sign your name here or add your name here, and it will take you to the actual text of the Charter, and there's a form you can fill out to sign your support. And in signing it, you're signing the spirit of this signing on to the spirit of this, what we hope will be a transformational effort in our Great Lakes. Um, was there someone else who got on there? I heard a voice. Someone else who wants to add? This, this is Frank again. And, and you know, I'm thinking that uh, of all the different things that people can be done, that, that people can do things, there's um, uh, there are you know community-wide things that can be done. There's there's uh, things that you can work on. Uh, you know, and when you work on the, on these issues, you can there may be issues before the U.S. Congress where you, you need to put efforts into lobbying on you know protecting the lakes and helping to protect those, these concepts. You may have find local ordinances that where governments are doing things or zoning issues. You can also find things that your family does. What what things do you, do you does your family wish to do? Uh, what uh, how do you uh, do? You have a, a you know, when you when you get together for a dinner, do you spend ten minutes talking about the water every time you have a big family gathering? Or do you do you try to do things that help bring this awareness there? And then it's down to your personal life. You know, what do you do personally? Do you thank the water every day? Uh, you know, are these the kind of things? So there, there's a, so many different levels that this can be done on, but it's something that everybody can be involved in. It isn't something that it's some group somewhere is doing it, and you either support them or you don't support them, or you you, you take time to do that. Everybody can do this and do something every day themselves, as well as support the efforts of others in groups and in other things. So I think that, that it's is wide open what people are able to do with it. Okay, so I have Patricia Campbell who wanted to make a comment, and then I have Chris and Anne after. So, Patricia, I've enabled your microphone. So, you might have to start your microphone, second icon in. Patricia, can you enable your mic? Oh, we really want to hear from you. Let's see. You um, might have to select your microphone too. So if you have more than one, uh, you just go to the second icon again and, and scroll to the bottom of the list. It should say select microphone. Is that you, Patricia? Um, so some people are asking where the icons are. If you look um, at the top of the um, screen, it, it, says, it should say meeting. And then there's several icons to the right of it. There's one that's for volume, one for mics, one for video, and one to raise your hand. Um, hopefully you can see those. Yes. Uh, mm. uh, oh, mm. thank you, Ricardo. Good point. Good point. 
So the, and the arrow that's next to the microphone, once you find the microphone, is what you click on that arrow next to it, it gives you the choice to turn it on and to change the volume and to select a microphone. Um, Patricia, can we hear you? Um, I guess not. Uh, who, who, uh, please type your question in. And we're going to okay. do some good suggestions about how to do a little more education on how to use the system next time. We will promise to do that. Mm -hmm. So we had Chris Riddell next. Uh, yes. Hey, guys. Um, yeah, I, was the, I just wanted to say that I think one of the hard things is uh, getting people to uh, understand why this matters. You know, because like the condition of the lakes, it's something that just a lot of people just don't think about every day. You know, you wake up in the morning and you don't think, oh, how are the lakes doing today? You know, it's you know it's something that I think a lot of people take for granted. So uh, I think that's one of the main things that uh, this movement is looking at, which is definitely an important thing. So uh, yeah. it's going to be hard to do. So like, how do we reach out to people then and get them to understand that, that this is an important issue and uh, make them understand it and support it too because this is something I support uh, very strongly as well that's why I'm uh, looking into it so much but um, but yeah I just think that's going to be one of the big fights you know getting people to recognize this as a real concern Chris that's re that's a I think that's a key thing that you're raising and that's in some ways that's what this is all about and what each of us will, in a way, be a charter bearer by helping um, reawaken that connection to our water. Just as Frank and others have said, it's, it, that's really, at the deepest level, what this work is. We have to reawaken our connection to the water and how we are of it and how to, how to do that. So um, let's open it up if people have ideas of how to reawaken that connection that Chris is talking about. Yeah, it's interesting too that uh, like the First Nations people, they had it right all along. You know, the the whole Commons perspective, that's how they've looked at it for thousands of years. You know, this is really an ancient idea that uh, I guess we Westerners have kind of lost, and uh, we need to bring it back. So uh, let's yeah. do it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, are there other people with hands up that want to weigh in or add their thoughts? I think Anne and Ricardo uh, had raised their hands. Okay. Yeah, I, I just wanted to comment um, to the, the last question because that really has um, been one of the challenges that we wanted to address um, in Milwaukee and that there really are great disconnects, um, particularly in this hyper-segregated city. Um, there's, there's differences in access to the water. Um, as you kind of move west, uh, west of our Milwaukee River, more into the central city, um, there's whole swaths of the city that there isn't a great connection with the lakefront or with uh, the rivers. And so um, as we have begun working, we, we, we're working with communities that their connection may be through different forms. It's, it's um, issues around food growing. Um, Milwaukee is a really um, important city now in, in urban food growing and, and that's where water is at the forefront of people's attention. So in that sense, um, there is a connection there but it may be, not be the same connection in every community. Um, likewise, in, in some of these neighborhoods, there's a, an excessive use of bottled water um, so that's a, a, a you know a connect or a disconnect um, that became the source of the work there. So um, I just wanted to mention that that that's really an important part of our work is how to improve those connections and give people opportunities. Mm.
Um, is, there, is anyone queued up for microphones? Because I know we're getting to the end of our call. I want to see if there's anyone else who's going to offer, hasn't spoken, wants to offer a thought. There's a lot of things coming in the chat. I can't even... <laughs> well, there's a lot of people typing into the chat, and so that's a... Um, we will um, share with everyone the recording of this, and I'll try to see if we can download the comments so we can also share those. I think we can do that in a document. Yeah, that's possible. So we'll share all that. Um, any anyone else queued up, Emma, that wanted to speak? No, that was it. So I want to thank. I just wanted to add one 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 other comment um, about the use of the charter that we had talked about earlier. Is that um, if, if you are in, a, in an oppositional in a fight somewhere, mm -hmm. that I think that this is another place that we can take the charter is to bring that to those places and to have us join all of these you know, individual fights that we may be fighting in our different communities and that this is a common ground that we can tie into. Mm. Um, so I wanted to ask Frank if you would be willing to close the meeting today and I uh, want to thank everybody that was on the call. We will be in touch. Please be in touch with us. This is a growing effort and you can be part of shaping it. Hi, Frank, are you there? Uh, yes, I, can you hear me now? Hello. Mm -hmm. I have unmuted my microphone. So. Yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you. You know, one of the things that, uh, that, that I've been taught in, in, our, in our traditions is, the, is the, the concept of seven generations and the idea that we should all consider the consequences of our actions to a time period long enough to encompass seven generations. And this is something that isn't like, I like to think of people want to count out the generations in front of you sometimes. And, but if you think of it more like a car driving down the road at night with its headlights shining in front, and if you think about the fact that there's, uh, that every, say every quarter mile you go down the road, your lights go another quarter mile down the road in front of you. Well, the idea is is that we, this seven generations is this buffer, it's this time that we never get to, but it's each of us have to think about as we take actions, what are the consequences in that long range view. And so, if we, uh, <clears throat> when we think about that, it's, it's a time period long enough that we're unlikely to know the names of those, of those people. They may not know our names. Uh, and uh, but we do things. It's like planting. It's like planting a tree that uh, that may be slow growing and you may never see it mature in your lifetime, but others will. But we also think about that although we think of seven generations in the coming generation, we also think about seven generations before us. What was it that our ancestors were doing that helped bring us to this point? You know, this community of people that are gathered today on this on this webinar has never been together exactly this way before and will never be together again exactly this way. This community came about through the actions of not just our own personal choices and actions, but how those actions were guided by all those generations before us. And what things did they do that, that, that they left for us? What, did, what teachings did they leave for us? What attitudes, what family values, what what different things were there that were that were put in place and were carried through by all those previous generations to bring us to this point? And as we as we think about that at this point, we also are thinking about what are we leaving for those coming generations? What are we leaving for those people later? Because we look back at our ancestors and say, well, the elders they thought about this and they taught this and they taught these different things that were that would help us be who we are today. But we have those same things that are being done for those coming generations. So when they look back at us, are they going to find us worthy of the things? Are they going to say, boy, those, those, those people, people in those days, they did these things and look at all the, the, the good things that are, that are around us. So when we think about what are we thinking about those coming generations, those coming generations are not just the human generation. Those coming generations are the fish, the birds, and the animals, all of the other beings that we share this, 
this world with. And so there's this interconnectedness that we find ourselves in that many people have talked about. And that, um, you know, and one of the one of the commenters made this point, and I, 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 forget, I forget his name, but I think it's really important that, that we're not trying to do something unnatural here. What we're actually trying to do is undo the unnatural mechanisms and things that we put in place that are all human created. And we're doing our very best to bring to bring our awareness and our governance and our management more in line with the natural world. So when we think of this, uh, we think of the common all the, as I mentioned, the fish don't know what nation they're from. One of the commenters commented on that. And, uh, you know, I, I think about the, these things that um, we're really trying to restore balance and to bring back those elements of, of the natural world and of the natural way of, of living. And so that's, that's the goal that we're doing while we're at the same time trying to live in a, in a modern technological world where we're using, we're using Adobe Connect to speak with each other from all over the region uh, simultaneously. and Instead of having to all travel to one spot uh, to do that, these are things that we have. Is that we have to move forward and use the best of what we can as we use as we move forward, and bring the best of the past with us, and try to restore those things that are important. And so I, I think about that as we're looking at this. And once again, I'll talk about how the commitments and things that can be done are personal. On any given time, at any given moment, you can stop and thank the water. You can do this in a variety of ways. You know, you can do things that make make it more comfortable for the water around your around your house or your property or your yard. Do things that would pollute less. You can take personal actions every day. You also can take family actions. Where you can have family gatherings. And you can do this in your community, and we can do this through our nations. And so, as we think about this, there are all of these different ways that we can act. And so when we get into all of this technical stuff, we can get into the specific wording and legislation that we can get into to, uh, county ordinances and sitting too long, sometimes contentious meetings of different sorts. We can get into all the technical things. But the bottom line is, is that the reason we're doing this is we love the water. And the song that we started with, the, the water song, is, I'd like to sing that song now as a closing for this, for this webinar. And when we sing that song, it's sung through four times, once for, once for each direction. And uh, it's, uh, it's a very powerful song because you're, you're, you're talking about loving the water. And you realize that as we do this, that the whole idea is that the water responds to those vibrations of the song and to the things that we do. And so when you think about that, each one of us is largely made up of water. And so those good feelings that we put out in this song reverberate through all of the other in our presence and around the song. They also, it's through all the other beings that are there. And so it strengthens the world. So our goals in life are to make the world a little bit better than we found it, instead of making it a little worse than we found it. We do that every day. Things go in a very positive way. And so I'd like to sing that song now and uh, for the, the closing. Me go me me go Ija when me me go me be kija ge go me guacho when me me go Ija when me me go me be Kija ge go, ni me guacho when ni me go, kija when ni me go, 
nida ki jage go ime kwacho enni me go ija wen me go oh miigwech thank you Thanks, everyone, and we'll send you the recording. Thank you, Frank.